hello everyone so again uh, welcome back to the latest lecture session uh, let's uh, as is customary have a quick recap of uh, what we have discussed in the last uh, session and then move on to the relevant aspects so i believe we have started looking at uh, the relevant aspects with respect to remediation of uh, contaminated ground water so as we discussed earlier we are going to get uh, look at uh, or consider two major uh, types of uh, contamination and how to remediate them one would be uh, contaminated ground water the other one would be contaminated soil or sediments so in that context uh, we start looking at uh, the relevant aspects with respect to contaminated ground water and one of the uh, what do we say ways that people often look at or have looked at anyway let's say is uh, pumping the water out let's say and that can also be a part of pumping it the water out and treating the water or just a strategy to contain the plume so in that context uh, we looked at i believe the aspects with respect to plume containment right so we looked at plume containment in the context of isolating the contaminant plume right and also trying to avoid let's say the plume reaching another aquifer as in let's say you have let's say a surface water body nearby a river or a stream let's say and you have a contaminated uh, site nearby that's uh, led to contamination of the ground water Uh, we obviously do not want the contaminant to be spread over a uh, wider area let's say causing further uh, what we say adverse effects to a greater number of population let's say right or greater populace let's say so thus obviously you want to limit that so again in such particular scenarios or depending obviously on the site you want to uh, limit the uh, or contain the plume so in that context we looked at certain aspects one aspect obviously that we looked at initially was that you know uh, we considered one particular case let's say when you know the hydraulic or the slope of the energy gradient or the hydraulic gradient is something like this and if we have a pump or to start pumping out here the flow lines would you know be something like this as in they would all flow towards the or the ground water would flow towards the uh, uh, what is it now pumping well right and symmetric uh, and and would be symmetrical i guess right but obviously this is not the case you know that uh, ground or uh, you know earth uh, surface has undulations and it has slopes let's say and obviously thus your uh, what do we say ground water too uh, will follow more or less that certain uh, profile let's say when uh, we try to uh, consider the ground water flow direction anyway right so obviously in that context we need to look at the slope of the energy gradient or the hydraulic gradient yes so obviously you know we are going to have a gradient here and that's what we see out here right so in that case if i pump it in from the same location at the same flow rate you see that you know uh, there are flow lines groundwater flow lines which are not going to be captured by the pump here right so the key aspect obviously that we need to consider is uh, where do i uh, place the pump and so on and so forth so in that context obviously i am dealing with uh, groundwater uh, flow and uh, movement so what aspects or what uh, what do we say uh, variables affect its movement now so obviously the type of aquifer let's say right uh, you know clay uh, clay soil uh, sandy soil and so on so but which aspect are we dealing with or considered uh, concerned with when we talk about these aspects with respect to the kind of aquifer we are talking about the hydraulic conductivity in general let's say right so we talked about uh, hydraulic conductivity let's say layman's terms the ease with which let's say water can uh, flow through your particular media let's say again layman's term obviously we need to know the uh, hydraulic gradient or the slope of the energy gradient right that's something we need why is that obviously it's going to affect your uh, ground water flow velocity let's say for example if it's uh, relatively stagnant uh, or you know the ground water flow velocities are relatively less let's say your strategy for containing them or pumping the water out would be different let's say compared to let's say if you have uh, uh, what do you say ground water with greater velocity obviously in that context you might need to have more uh, number of wells because you know the plume would uh, or you know there will be greater uh, number of flow lines let's say that would be uh, that that would have to be captured let's say uh, and in that context obviously we are concerned with those aspects and obviously the aquifer thickness again right so these aspects we discussed briefly so how do we go about that we have different models we can do that but typically we mentioned that we look at the design given by or uh, the simulation given by Havendel et al right so that's something we looked at and what did they give us an idea about so for different number of wells let's say here we are looking at the case for two wells here let's say they give us an idea about what's the distance from the center line of the well which is this 
to the let us say the stagnation point let us say right for its capture zone let us say right this width right and it also gives you an idea about what is the width required at the or what is the width of the plume that will be captured along the center line of the wells and it will also give you an idea about what is the width of the plume that will be captured far upstream right. So, these are different wells and it will also give you an idea about the spacing between the different wells let us say right and you know based upon this obviously you can design for the relevant aspects. So, here what do we have for example, for 1, 2, 3, 4 and different kinds of wells we have the spacing between the wells capture zone width at the wells and capture zone far upstream right. What do we have here we have let us say if this is the uh, what do we say flow pattern that is going to be captured by the uh, let us say 2 wells let us say what do we have we have the spacing between the 2 wells let us say uh, from this table again from that particular uh, literature we have capture zone width at the wells. So, we have this particular width and we also have capture zone width at far upstream right we, uh, it will also give you an idea about this distance too. But again that is not mentioned in these guidelines, but it is available in the source uh, what do we say uh, literature there right. So, then we moved on to looking at uh, design how do I go about uh, designing the particular uh, you know setup or system now right. In this context uh, what do we need to look at let us say or what are some of the limiting factors in that uh, aspect we saw that drawdown right say. For example, you know you start uh, you, uh, you know setting up an extraction well pump, pumping water out at a certain flow rate let us say you know you are going to have a certain drawdown let us say right. So, typically be based upon let us say the relevant aspects or the field conditions let us say you are going to have maximum or uh, what do we say maximum permissible drawdowns or such let us say right. So, for example, if you typically keep increasing the uh, flow rate you will uh, typically end up with uh, you know greater uh, drawdown I guess let us say. So, obviously, we need to be concerned with drawdown. In that context we had a particular uh, formula here let us say where I guess we have different variables some of which are listed here let us say and again here we have uh, the well function let us say again for that we have the relevant aspects how do we calculate that for different uh, conditions right we have these aspects let us say right. So, based on that obviously you can calculate the uh, well function uh, pardon me or using the well function you can calculate the drawdown given that you have a particular flow rate and you know the aquifer conditions let us say right and again obviously the time and distance from center line radius of center line as in what does this particular variable mean it means let us say if this is my well let us say and uh, this is the hydraulic gradient let us say and this is the drawdown or such ok. So, r will be the distance at which let us say from the center line of the well at which I am trying to calculate the uh, drawdown let us say right. So, that is going to be r storage coefficient transmissivity uh, aquifer properties let us say again uh, drawdown is what I am going to calculate and time since pumping began anyway. So, what I have is uh, given aquifer properties let us say and uh, I know where it is I want to calculate the drawdown I can come up with uh, calculating the uh, drawdown given. I have the flow rate required, but how do I get the flow rate required and such right. So, now let us look at uh, the design here. So, here let us say uh, we have this particular case let us say as in I know my plume shape let us say ok. For example, assume that this is my plume uh, shape and size let us say right and now I know the thickness of the plume here or let me draw that out here let us say this is my plume let us say. So, I know the plume width far upstream and also somewhere out here let us say right or near it is uh, fag end let us say right. So, based upon this particular uh, you know uh, width I can come up with let us say what would be the capture zone required at the wells and capture zone width required far upstream. For that I will choose some trial wells let us say I can start with one or start with two let us say right. So, I know let us say if it is 50 meters let us say and uh, that should be the capture zone with the at the width at the wells. I can equate this particular capture zone width at the wells to be equal to 50 meters right and I can calculate the relevant aspects with being what can I calculate I can calculate q let us say right. So, what am I doing again I am going to go with a trial design based upon the capture zone width uh, of the or capture zone width required for that particular plume let us say right. 
So based on that what do I do I am going to estimate let us say what is the width required at uh, the wells and far upstream right. From that I am going to get the draw pardon me the flow rate that I have for that particular number of wells. In this context we are looking at only one well and then I can calculate Q let us say right. So from the Q what do I do I then calculate the drawdown right. For example I now have Q here right and then I can calculate the drawdown right. So then I am going to see is this drawdown within the relevant limits that uh, you know uh, I have out there in the on site or not. If it is uh, you know uh, greater than or the drawdown that I am estimating uh, would be greater than this particular drawdown which is the permissible value then what do I need to do? I need to iterate again. So for example let us say uh, I have a maximum drawdown of Z max that is allowable but my drawdown end up with being greater than Z max right. So what do I do? So instead of one well I am now going to have two wells right say right. So again same case if this is the flow line here two wells let us say again so on. So then again I will calculate Q. How do I calculate Q now? Again here Q by BU will be equal to let us say now 50 meters now right. Obviously now Q will be relatively less uh, hopefully here let us say right. And then uh, I am going to get the relevant Q right. Again once I calculate the relevant uh, flow rate or you know uh, for that relevant iteration of uh, number of wells I am going to you know be able to calculate the drawdown and then uh, go along in that manner until I reach a particular set of uh, wells that would meet both the criteria of capturing the plume width let us say and also being able to meet the drawdown restrictions I guess right. So that is how I can go about that typically Excel is good enough uh, what we say way to go about that. Uh, but obviously there are some aspects here uh, that we need to consider as in you need to have a factor of safety right. How do I you know get to that particular aspect or where is the factor of safety coming into picture here right factor of safety. And one other aspect is that this this equation right uh, this is the this equation I guess right is uh, works well for uh, unconfined aquifers unconfined aquifers okay it works well for that. But for confined aquifers I guess you know uh, one should proceed with caution that is what I understand let us say you know so has I think it has some restrictions with respect to the confined aquifer and also the aspect here that I guess people assume or take into account is that the uh, what is extraction well penetrates through the thickness of the particular relevant aquifer uh, depending upon the scenario again. So that is one aspect. And also we assume that the flow lines are uh, parallel, groundwater flow lines are parallel. But obviously this might not be the case depending upon the type of uh, what we say subsurface media out there. For example, if you have clay interspersed with sand and so on, water would typically like to take the path of least resistance right. So it would like to flow around clay let us say through the sand and so on let us say or it would like to flow or it take the path of least resistance. But anyway here we are going to obviously or you know we assume that the flow lines are parallel that is something to keep in mind. But obviously we are talking about factor of safety right. So that is uh, one particular aspect let us say we try to look at or consider for now. So I am just trying to let us say calculate let us say the flow uh, for a given width let us say this is the cross section let us say okay uh, through a particular uh, width let us say right. How do I get that? Uh, so area into velocity. So it is going to be area into velocity which is the flow rate of uh, groundwater velocity here. So what is the area now that is going to be width into thickness here, thickness of the aquifer let us say or width into uh, groundwater flow velocity. So how do I get this width? I can get that from here and that is equal to my capture zone width at the wells 0.5 Q by BU let us say. So B into 0.5 Q by BU into U right. So what do I see it is equal to 0.5 Q, Q is the rate of pumping, Q is the rate of pumping. So what is it that we have looked at? We see that the uh, groundwater flow or flow rate through that particular cross section let us say is going to be half of what we are actually pumping out let us say. So what is it that we are doing now? We are pumping out or the factor of safety lies in that if you look at the design we are actually pumping out twice the minimum amount of water required to be able to capture the plume. Again how did we do that? Here we are just trying to let us say estimate what is the flow rate through a particular cross section for the given groundwater flow velocity let us say right 
and for that cross section though what do I choose? I choose the aquifer thickness and the width uh, let us say capture zone width at the well let us say if there were uh, you know relevant uh, pumps installed and such let us say. And from our Havendal at all we know we have this particular uh, set of variables to be equal to our width and I plug that in and what do I see? I see that the rate of pumping is going to be equal to twice the flow rate uh, ground water flow rate through that particular uh, what do you say now uh, cross section or such I guess right. So, herein lies our factor of safety again right. So, what is it that we have been up to for example, the top view this is the width let us say capture zone width at the wells and we have the uh, aquifer thickness, thickness that we considered B let us say and what did we look at we were trying to calculate or we calculated what would be the flow uh, actual ground water flow through that particular uh, what do we say uh, uh, section let us say right and we came up with the relevant aspects and tried to relate that to the uh, uh, rate of pumping that we would have if and when we install the uh, extraction wells and what do we see again that the amount of water that we are pumping out is twice the or the flow rate anyway is twice the flow rate of the uh, ground water flow right. So, that is uh, one aspect to look at and consider let us say right and here uh, thus far we have looked at uh, pump uh, plume containment pardon me. So, the next aspect would be pumping the water out and treating it right. So, in this context uh, what have we looked at we did look at one example already at the one in uh, the case with respect to Ghaziabad anyway right. So, what have we uh, looked at there let us say right or what is the scenario there? Uh, they had a source of chromium come to contamination chromium 3 let us say right and uh, or chromium 6 pardon me chromium 6 contamination and chromium 6 is carcinogenic let us say and it is also toxic carcinogenic and non carcinogenic effects and I believe you had the ground water flow direction in this particular uh, direction pardon me let us say and then the migration of the uh, relevant uh, plume and so on let us say right plume shape can vary obviously depending upon type of uh, or you know uh, aquifer conditions and the type of ground water uh, flow conditions that you have. Anyway let us say you have something like this you know and what did what were they doing they uh, installed the pump and treat uh, system as in they were pumping the water out taking it off site or above ground and above ground right and then they were reducing reducing chromium 6 to chromium 3 and chromium 3 is less soluble in water. So, that is going to precipitate out right and then this precipitate they were sending to a landfill yes and this particular treated water they were not re-injecting it, but they were using it for land applications such as gardening and so on. Again not an ideal scenario uh, because you still have considerable or uh, relatively high concentrations of uh, chromium, but this is what they have been up to. And also I believe they looked at introducing uh, what we say uh, bacteria or microbes that could uh, reduce chromium 6 to uh, chromium 3 right and again why do they want to do that obviously because they want to de derive energy for their own needs again. So, here what uh, are we looking at? We are looking at pumping the water out and then treating the water here uh, they are looking at redox process. So, what are some of the other ways that people look at uh, treating ground water? They are air stripping let us say depending upon how volatile or non volatile the compound might be or you can have the water treated by granular activated carbon filtration as in GIC relatively uh, what do we say? Or organic contaminants and such you know typically a decent way to uh, you know uh, treat the water let us say or you can have advanced oxidation process let us say I will call them AOP advanced oxidation process. Uh, we call them advanced oxidation process because typically they involve the formation of let us say a hydroxyl radical hydroxyl ra radical which is a strong oxidizing uh, compound let us say why is it because it has an unpaid electron as in it wants to accept an electron and go to its more stable state which is the OH or hydroxyl uh, pardon me OH minus phase I guess right. right. And this is what it strongly favors to do. So, this acts as a strong oxidizing agent right. So, at again advanced oxidation process either O3 or I mean ozonation or UV plus H2O2 and so on and so forth let us say right. So, again different aspects again uh, typical redox process to other than AOP2 let us say. So, different aspects here let us say. So, before I go further let us say we can also consider 
rather than pumping the water out extraction trenches let us say or extraction wells. So, I am not going to pump water out what am I going to do is if I have what relatively shallow contaminated zones let us say what am I going to do uh, let us say this is the uh, side uh, view let us say I am going to dig a extraction trench let us say and line it with a geotextile membrane let us say at least in here if the groundwater flow direction is this way right. And what is that going to leave for because you know I have a trench here the groundwater flow in that particular vicinity would be towards that particular extraction trench I can let it accumulate here and then pump the accumulated water out. And again what is the role of this geotextile membrane at the sides because if I do not have that you know smaller particles you know will uh, seep through right. So, to prevent that I am going to again have a geotextile membrane to limit the uh, transport of these relatively smaller particles. So, again extraction wells again they would work well only with uh, at uh, shallow depths though. But obviously you know different uh, what do we say types of uh, treatment techniques have their own drawbacks obviously right. So, let us look at you know some such cases where it might it as in pump and treat might work or you know or does not work as well I guess. So, here we are going to look at a particular uh, real time uh, plume shape. So, here we have a plume typically spreading by advection let us say and dispersion. Uh, before we go further I think some particular uh, what we say explanation is uh, required in this regard. So, typically transport of contaminants or uh, such you know transport when you talk about transport of contaminants we talk about two aspects or two ways by which <coughs> the contaminant uh, can be transported we talk about advection. Advection in the sense let us say if there is a net flow of fluid either gas or liquid let us say uh, in uh, net flow of fluid in any, any particular direction and then obviously you are going to have the contaminant being transported due to this net flow of fluid in, uh, along with you know in some direction let us say then I am going to call that particular transport uh, you know of the contaminant uh, advection I guess right. So, again uh, one particular example let us say obviously what is it now I have a stream let us say. So, in the stream you have you do have net flow of a fluid or in this case liquid in one particular direction. So, if there is a contaminant release at a particular point so obviously along with the water flowing in the stream let us say you are going to have a contaminant transport and that I am going to refer to as advection or for example let us say if there is wind blowing in one direction let us say consistently let us say and I have let us say a source of air pollution let us say a chimney out there or someone burning a pile of garbage or such and if that particular you know air pollutant is being carried along with the wind which again as a stress is flowing <coughs> or has a net flow in any particular direction let us say then I am going to call that to be advection let us say. But again what would I refer to as diffusion let us say or when would I you know refer to a particular transport as being diffusion let us say. For example, let us say you know if uh, I open a scent bottle here let us say right and I have uh, the windows, doors and everything closed in this particular room and if there was a person sitting at the far end of the room after some time he can still smell the particular uh, you know scent let us say. How can he sense it now let us say as in there is net flow of fluid no nope, none here. How is it uh, that he can sense that particular compound let us say or smell it rather right. Uh, even though there is no net flow of fluid now how is the contaminant traveling from here to the person who might be sitting at the far end of the room now right. How, how is that going to take place through diffusion now and here the driving force obviously is that you have a concentration gradient as in at this location the concentration of the relevant compound is high compared to the uh, you know uh, that particular location out there at the far end of the room. So, thus you are going to have random uh, what do we say uh, transport of or randomized transport of the relevant molecules let us say right. So, as in all the directions and what is the driving force or what does it drive towards it will drive towards such a state when the concentration in that particular system is to, uh, going to be the same let us say. For example, initially the concentration is high and low at some other place diffusion will drive the system such that the concentration is the same at uh, all the uh, particular or the concentration is the same in that system right. So, when concentration is high at one location and low at one another location. So, you are going to have molecular diffusion from this particular uh, location to the other. So, again that is how I am describing diffusion as let us say right. But another example would be again what we have discussed would be molecular diffusion right molecular diffusion and that is something remarkably slow you know remarkably slow right. But let us say uh, if again I am going to consider the same case I have all my doors windows closed and then I have open up the scent bottle 
how can I see to it that say that he can he or she at the end of the room can sense this uh, or detect this compound faster I can turn on the fans right. So, what conditions would I be creating in this particular room then I will be creating turbulent conditions let us see. So, in that case you know you will have a different diffusion coefficient which is relatively higher I think maybe 2 orders of magnitude higher typically and I will have turbulent diffusion as in what uh, one aspect that people need to understand here is just because I turn on the fans does not mean it is going to be advection why is that let us say you have 4 fans or so here let us say and I turn them on I am not going to have net flow of the fluid in any particular direction. So, it cannot be advection right, but still I am considering or <coughs> creating turbulent conditions and again it is still going to be diffusion, but now rather than molecular diffusion it is going to be turbulent diffusion right. <coughs> again that is different aspect we are going to talk about these in greater detail relatively uh, later on. So, in the context of groundwater, though you come across uh, the aspect or the term called dispersion though, right and here we have two aspects one would be diffusion and also the what we say. Uh, dilution of this particular contaminant let us say due to the different tortuous paths present in let us say or different paths that your molecule can take. Uh, let us say here you have different particles soil particles let us say right. So, a contaminant entering here has different paths to take it can either end up here and up here and up here or such let us say. So, to this particular case which I am referring to as dispersion let us say you will again have what we say uh, dilution of your particular uh, contaminant here. So, here again what are we looking at as you see here we have the source this is the source of contamination let us say and due to ground water flow in this direction this is the contaminant plume due to advection, advection as in here we have ground water flow in one particular direction as we see here. And so, this particular contaminant has travelled over a certain area let us say or to a certain extent because of its transport by that particular net flow of fluid let us say. And here the you do still see additional what do we say dilution, but not much let us say and that is uh, relevant or dependent upon dispersion let us say right some of the aspects of which we have looked at here. So, again uh, dispersion typically or diffusion pardon me diffusion is uh, not of great uh, consequence in surface water bodies why is that because the surface water uh, flow velocities are relatively high right. So, the transport uh, what do you say contaminant transport by these particular surface water streams is going to be uh, due to advection anyway is going to be much higher compared to the transport due to uh, diffusion let us say it is remarkably slow. So, for surface water bodies though you can thus uh, neglect diffusion right because advection is so high compared to diffusion now. But in ground water though the ground water flow velocities as you know are remarkably slow let us say right so, a few meters per year let us say right. So, in that context though diffusion or you know the contaminant uh, what we say transport due to dispersion is what we say important too and that is something that you can visualize out here too right. So, again something here this is one aspect that we need to look at and why are we going to look at that we are going to come back to that. So, here let us say again uh, simulation to capture of the front of the plume let us say different aspects. So, here let us say we have extraction wells flow lines that can be captured you know those that cannot be captured we looked at the design and such, but here we have relevant aspect here let us say <coughs> as in what is the relevant aspect here that we are assuming that the plume is going to behave or you know flow in this manner right. And obviously, because now I am going to start pumping out this is what uh, you know the behavior is going to look like and that we assume or presume for these conditions that we are going to capture the relevant plume let us say right. So, moving on again top view let us say. So, we have a relevant well here you know relatively fast the flow lines approaching that particular well, but those at the periphery relatively moderate and those flow lines that are not affected by this pumping well obviously they will be at the ground water flow velocity or they will be relatively slow right say right. So, you have moderate on the periphery fast uh, along center or near the center let us say as the center line of the well and slow outside the capture zone limit right again general aspects. So, in this context <coughs> let us say we are going to look at different aspects here or two particular examples here. So, here we have the plan view and here we have the side view let us say. So, here you have the plume and here you have the uh, extraction well and factor of safety let us say they have taken it such that it is going to cover a wider area 
and same case here we see that from the side view here you have the extraction well upstream obviously because you have a slope here right you have a slope here that is why you see this phenomenon obviously this is something we have talked about and again I think it is self explanatory out here uh, greater capture uh, zone area downstream and upstream relatively less I guess right. So, that is something we have here and again this particular case of uh, plume treatment uh, or pump and treat pardon me can also go hand in hand with different techniques you can also have barriers let us say for example, this is my plume. So, I am immediately able to put in what do we say uh, a barriers that would restrict the hydraulic conductivity or decrease the transport due to advection let us say. For example, let us say the spill ha is relatively recent or I detected the spill relatively recently. So, what can I do? I can put in a barrier along the uh, what do you say or I can create a, peri a perimeter of a relatively impermeable uh, barrier right say right and then I can start pumping the water out and that is what you see here. So, you see in the side view you see that barrier walls and then the relevant extraction well let us say right. And then moving on obviously, if I am going to have an extraction I need to do something with the uh, uh, water that I treat out. So, typically you have injection wells going along or hand in hand with extraction wells. So, here you are pumping water out let us say and here you are re-injecting the relevant water let us say and this is your obviously contaminated plume. Again there is some science or there is uh, science behind or you know there is logic behind how or where to place these uh, you know injection wells for optimal uh, what do we say uh, or you know for greater efficiency. Again it depends upon the stagnation zones let us say ground water flow velocities and the type of aquifer characteristics I guess again that is for a di different case maybe. So, in this context again this particular case we have different stagnation zones and you know we have relevant pumping wells I believe it will be much more apparent in this picture. So, what do we have here we have the hydraulic head contour map here. For example, 543, 542, 140, 39 decreasing towards 535 let us see right 535, 535, 535. So, what do we have? We are going to have extraction wells here let us say or the stagnation zones let us say towards which the ground water is typically flowing and an injection well here where you have a relatively higher head let us say right. So, what is it that I am trying to promote? I am trying to put in water where it would naturally flow towards the extraction wells again thereby you know taking the contaminant along with it let us say right. So, again in this case we have the uh, velocities but again typically you know looking at the heads and such and then obviously ground water velocities or the contour maps will let you know uh, where to place the injection wells and the extraction wells let us say right. So, here we have a uh, actual scenario and that is uh, uh, which is contaminated by volatile organic carbon, volatile organic compounds not carbon pardon me which we refer to as VOCs toxic and uh, sometimes carcinogenic too depending upon the type of compound. So, here we have 3 or 4 uh, cases we need to look at before we understand the figure we have the flow line groundwater flow lines we have the extraction well locations we have what do we say potential groundwater stagnation uh, zones let us say and here we have the plume limits let us say. For example, until now we have typically looked at let us say only uh, when we talk about plume boundary we looked at only one particular boundary or such. But obviously, when we talk about boundary we are talking about a plume you know uh, which contains let us say a concentration of compound or a certain concentration of compound. So, for example, if I want to if this plume pertains to 10 ppm concentration a 1 ppm concentration will obviously plume will obviously cover a wider area and 10 or you know 100 ppm or such a relatively lesser area right. So, that is something that we have here again in that we have a plume boundary for 1, 10, 100 and 1000 ppm I guess you know and what do we have here now. So, here you have different uh, zones of contamination with respect to the green line which is only for 1 ppm let us say and then orange, uh, pink and uh, again uh, let us say light green. So, here typically the way that these particular extraction wells have been set up they have been trying to limit what do we say or uh, extract water relevant to the 100 and 1000 uh, ppb I guess pardon me not ppm ppb or parts per billion uh, uh, contaminated VOC ground water I guess. So, as you see here what are the major areas that we are trying to look at this particular area 
and certainly with this particular light green here, uh, let me locate that here, yes, here we have that particular light green area and again this 100 ppb contours, I guess, right. So, we are trying to design our particular or design our particular extraction system, let us say, in such a way that I am capturing all the uh, contaminant plumes that would be pertinent to or relevant to 100 and 1000 ppb. And thus, as you see here, as would typically be the case, you have localized groundwater flows, let us say. Here you see this pathway for the groundwater flows and here again you see this different particular pathway here, right. So, depending upon site conditions, let us say and the extent to which you have uh, what do we say uh, non-homogeneous contamination, let us say, which is the case here, you need to go for what do we say relatively more complex, uh, uh, what do we say kind of uh, placement of the system, let us say. That is something that we see here. That is one particular drawback. And the major drawback here is that you know the profile that we are going to view, which is what we are going to look at now, uh, due to some particular cases, let us say, is going to be widely different from one compound to the other and one kind of aquifer uh, media to the other. And let us look at what we have here. So, this is what we have here in the sense that we have on the y axis, we have relative concentration of the compound and we have the standard to which we want to treat it and we have the extent of uh, what we say time required here let us see or time on the x axis let us see. So, what is the ideal behavior let us say? Ideal behavior would be such that I turn on uh, or start pumping, I start pumping water out and once all this contaminant plume is removed, the concentration of the relevant compound in the water should be almost 0 or you know within the standard. So, where is that particular theoretical removal that is what I have here. So, this zone we have pumping on let us say. So, almost all the contaminant has been removed let us say at this phase and then the contaminant concentration in the water should be almost 0 let us say and here pumping off you know you should not see any further contaminant con uh, concentration in the uh, uh, in the ground water. But that is not going to the case you are going to have first this kind of a behavior you are not going to have a sharp decrease here you are going to have this kind of a tailing behavior let us say tailing behavior and then even after stopping the pumping you will increase you will again see an increase in the conditions or the groundwater uh, uh, contaminant concentration I guess right. So, why is that and how does it affect the efficiency of your uh, pump and treat this is these are questions that need to be asked or uh, and again uh, looked at before you choose the option for pump and treat. So, this is an aspect we are going to talk about in a bit more detail in the next class and do some or look at some uh, math in this regard I guess right. So, with that I will end my session for today and thank you.